Hello, good evening, good morning, wherever you are, it is dropped kickoff time once again. I'm Nick Wasiliev. I've got Nathan Williamson by my side. We're not even messing around. Uh, we're literally going to talk some squad news. It is falling during our working day, and we're going to literally smash through as much as we can um, discussing this Wallaby squad for the first match against Los Pumas. Nathan, uh, you have seen the squad. You have spoken with the, with uh, with Joe and uh, I believe Andrew Kellaway and Isaac Kalia, um in, over the last you know, 24 hours or so. How are we feeling? What's the mood about this squad? It's an interesting one. It's a nice little lunch lunchtime catch-up here. It's great. Um, I know. The mood is... <laughs> oh, it's re- refreshing for Friday. Um, it, the I mood know. is actually pretty, really positive. Um, like, obviously, the big news is Harry Wilson being captain. That's been sort of speculated for the past couple of days and got confirmed this morning. Um, Joe was real sensible about it. Like, I think people are sort of uh, have reacted to it, but Joe, for a while, has been clear that, you know, He's more of a leadership guy rather than just whoever's got the seat. Like that's what's more important to him. So didn't really say much. I didn't really sort of confirm that Harry would be the long-term captain, but it looks like for the next two, he's going to be the man. But it was all all positive news coming out of Joe and sort of looking to tame the Argentinian beast with a lot of rain and Augusta Crevy's last match. There's a lot of sort of different elements that he was, that he was discussing about sort of what's going to be key on Sunday, like our time when they run out. Let's quickly before we before we dive into the actual squad itself. Let's let's discuss kind of the conversations that that Joe kind of spoke about. If I can, I want to dive into that a little bit more. I mean, um, obviously Harry. I think you know Harry is is a really big influential guy. He's been really good since he's come back into the Wallaby framework and, and into that space. Um, but I personally it wouldn't have been my first choice for you know the, the likes of, of of captain. What was kind of the the thought process that Joe gave talking about that? But more to the point, I mean, he's only had 15 tests and also it's been, you know, there's been a lot of captains this year. I know there's probably, you know, figuring stuff out. It's clearly that clearly clear they're going to try and shuffle the deck around, move some things around, see what is working, what isn't. It's good that there are other captains in that squad as well, super, super rugby captain. So Harry isn't on his own. What's the feeling around that captaincy space, particularly with Harry, and what did kind of Joe say on it? There's a number of sort of factors that we'll go into. Just to start with, I think it's more around the balance of the squad itself. I think with Tani Altupa now an option, he was, you know, coming back into the fold. Joe was more keen. Joe believes that he can manage the minutes more with Tani Ella or can get a gauge of how he's going if he's starting. So that sort of means your regular captain now, Altoa is on the bench. Um, James Slipper uh, welcomed his... Um, we're going to birth his new child over the week, over the last sort of mm. seven days. So he was late into camp when Joe's policy throughout this has been, if you're late sort of, or not if you're late, if you have a disrupted sort of build to a, a week of training, that it's better just to give you the week off just to kind of make sure you're fresh. So it kind of just left him with, well, do I go with Harry who took the captaincy for the last sort of 20, 30 minutes against um, the Springboks or do I go with Jake Gordon, someone who's captain before, but probably still trying to find his spot in the nine, in that nine jersey and, Joe's explanation was more around I, Jake as a nine. He's already already covering a lot of meters. He's already having to go through a lot of work. So he didn't exactly want to heighten that burden on him as he's returning from a, from a knock. Like he thought, you know, Harry was more a leader through actions, leader through someone who's, you know, probably going to get through close to 80 minutes. It's just sort of a more stable option for this time. As I mm. sort of alluded to before, will Harry be captain long-term? I don't think so. I think... If you if Fraser McWright was around, he probably would be captain at this point. Just from if you go off their past times at NRC and other teams the two have been involved in. But at this moment, Harry just gets the chance to sort of cement cement his spot first and foremost and show he can be a, a key sort of part of that leadership group heading forward. Maybe it's my own bias, but I do like the idea of kind of what the, the loose forward captaincy position because of you know how loose forwards have been employed by the Wallabies, you know, they're on the field for the vast majority of the game. Uh, structure works, particularly if you have someone who's got their head screwed on, um, you know, like a hoops in the past, um, who could really kind of make sure that there's good and also having good, you know, s- structured players around him in support. So let's dive into this squad and we'll kind of touch on that point, key thing here. I'm not going to lie. Let's just go positions and we'll also cover the substitutes at the same time. Um, this front three it looks fan- fantastic. You've got Bell, Matty Fesla, yes, and Kenny Tupo uh, starting, which is great. Um, and not only that, um, the likes of Josh Nasser coming off uh, the the bench in addition to the two prop options of Isaac Kalia, who's looked really, really promising. And, of course, as you mentioned earlier, Alan Alatoa, um, the veteran coming off the bench. I mean, 
props options for days that's fantastic uh i think the, the weak spot for me is of course the, the hooker position but purely based on the fact that you know maddie and, and josh haven't had that much game time together i think only like you know 12 test matches between them but lots of like in this starting uh, this starting front row in, in terms of props this is near our full strength outside of slips maybe I mean, the way Isaac Kylie has played in these sort of last three or four tests as well, you can sort of make the argument that he could get in that best 23. I mean, when you look at that hooker position, I mean, you've got Dave Parecki still to come back in. Uh, Lachlan Lonigan will probably come back into the reckoning in 2025. So we are down a couple of people to long-term injuries. But mate, Matty Fesler and um, Josh Nash have both should have shown they can they can handle at test level. And mate, this, is, this is one of those things, you look at this front row and go, Okay, this this can dominate. This can be a real weapon for us on Sunday. Mm, absolutely. And uh, look, I wasn't expecting BPA to go straight into the starting side. I think nah. you know there has been a lot of positives that have come out of it, and I think he's a fantastic backup option. Um, you know, so it was. Uh, it, it's not really a surprise to see Maddie and, and Josh r- retain their positions. So um, you, you work with 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 what you have, and they've definitely shown a lot of promise uh, this season. Um, second row uh, starting side: Nick Frost and Lucan Salakai Loto. Not really a lot of surprises uh, for me, and nah. then you. Have have Jeremy Williams um, off the bench. Um, I'm surprised that. Uh, I mean, I do know that Nick Frost has kind of been hanging around, going into that into the side a few times, and um, I think uh, I'm surprised. I think him and, and Lucan work, work quite well together. They've done a lot of stuff together, and 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 had some of that game time together. And considering how strong that Argentinian lineout is, and those and that engine room is, um, do you think this is the best option, or do you reckon someone like Williams also there's something in that selection too? No, I think you need the size. I mean, I think that, as you mentioned right there, um, they, they seem to just be the perfect combo. Lurkan being the sort of general line-out focus guy who can really call plays and focus on that real set piece, while Nick Frost is a freakish athlete who sort of defies his size and build to really get himself around the park. And, you know, I think they work perfectly together. They give you the size that you need against Argentina. And, yeah, I think this is in sort of outside of overseas play, people coming back in. This is our first choice, block pairing. And he's fast, and Frosty is oh, yeah. fast as well. So if you get him in space, just good night to any sort of back that has to has to come up against him. Um, uh, out to the sec- um to the outside of uh, outside forwards to kind of round off the forward pack, and, and we kind of alluded to that. You know, I think it makes Har- Wilson's job a lot easier if he has some good heads around him, um, and he certainly has one in in Bobby V, who st- who retains being at number six. Um, obviously, of course, uh, McWright would probably be our other choice going in, but Carlo Tizano retains his spot for a third uh, for his third Test match in Wallaby Gold. Um, honestly, I think this is I, I've liked Tizano. I think he hasn't necessarily had the uh, playmaker or game changer potential that, that McWright has. But then again, it's early days for him, and the one thing that is really impressive about him, and that probably will probably play into him. In it from a benefactor, particularly against Argentina, is the fact that the dude is just nuts with his work rate um, and tackles like crazy. He looks for work, and sometimes you need a big old bastard who just is prepared to just do the the all the the dirty, nasty tackles that never make the highlight reel. And I feel like Tizano is one of them, Fardy esque, and I like I me did. some Fardy esque vibes. He's a dog. He's a D O double W G. I love it. And I mean, like, sure, Fraser, Fraser McWright, like his positioning is well class, and you're not going to have someone instantly come in and, and replace that. But Carlo, in terms of defensive side of the ball, just gives you the closest like for like we have. And, you know, mm-hmm. Rob's in great form as well. And I didn't get the chance to mention as well, but I mean, Harry Wilson, for a man who's gone through a wild 12 months where it was not being selected from the squad of a World Cup, breaking his arm before Super, and now coming back to be captain, like, it's an amazing achievement for him, and generally one of the nicest blokes out there in Australian rugby right now. Like he is, if anyone deserves this honour and to call himself the Wallabies captain, I know it's him, and he'd be beaming with pride. So I just want to get that point off that I'm so happy to see just a person like that get rewarded with such an honour. Mm, he's he's definitely someone who's passionate. I mean, I think one of my favourite absolute memories of him is that head of steam up running straight mm. at. 100 meter run up straight at Artie Savia with absolutely no fear. Um, and you know, I, I, I appreciate someone with heart 
who who goes like that, which is great. Also to mention, I think, you know, even if uh, McWright comes into the side eventually at some point in the future, I think Tizano is probably playing for a regular feature um, still here in that regard because there's still that bench option, uh, a loose forward yeah. bench option to consider. Um, as much as I do think, you know, Lange Gleeson, who is out, who is, you know, in the number 20 uh, position, um, as the substitutes at present, has looked really, really good whenever he's been in gold. I feel like when it comes to work rate, at this current point in time, Desano is kind of beating him, which is, you know, reflected in him starting in the side over Gleeson. Um, so I think considering that there is other players lining up for that position once McWright returns, uh, still plenty on the line for both him and Tizano, uh, both Gleeson and Tizano um, based on this Argentinian tour. Yeah, particularly if you go for a 6-2 split as well and you're looking for that, which Joe sort of Joe's indicated in the past that he could be sort of more accustomed to against your bigger forward packs. And, you know, we saw Luke Rama feel the role um, a couple of tests ago. And if Carlo can continue sort of performing like he is in the next two games, then absolutely he, f- he will figure around this 23 for, for years to come, you'd suggest, and sort of serve as that just perfect perfect backup or perfect person just to keep pushing McWright to keep getting better and better and better. And we're... Mm-hmm. It'd be a luxury. It'd be a nice luxury to have the, the two just keep kicking on. Luxury. It's onto that. Let's move on to the halves combinations. Uh, we already alluded to, to Jake Gordon a little bit. He will. Uh, he's in the starting side um, to partner with Noah Alessio again. Tate McDermott again uh, back on the bench um, with Ben Donaldson serving as the utility. He'll be either you know coming in in, in the fly half capacity or should any injuries persist, you know shift into that back three um, as well. So, I mean, obviously, there's still a lot of question marks um, around uh, what the halves combination looks like. No Nick White in the squad this time around, um, even though I thought, you know, I was expecting a, a, the, the combination with him and Alessio, given the game time they've spent together, um, to be a little better. And I actually think, I think everyone kind of came to an agreement that Noah played a much better second game against the box in that second match. Um, you know, lot the, that 4022, which we've been talking about over previous episodes, uh, just a bit more game awareness, um, uh, and being a lot better with his tactical kicking. Um, I'm quite excited to see how he goes. Uh, I think Noah, it's, it's a case of just growing and building that confidence, um, at this point and actually having the time under the belt, um, more, give the boy more. Uh, so, but he's put partnership with Gordon is interesting. Do you, like when you look at the actual halves combinations of the starting side, I still am not totally convinced on Gordon partnering with Alessio. I like to view these halves combinations as who partners with who best case example for me being the all blacks with DMAC. I actually think they really need to bring quarters Ratima into the starting side for the all blacks, for example, because they work together at the chiefs so incredibly well. And clearly they understand a game plan and the strategy and synergy uh, is quite strong. Um, you know, I'm still not as convinced on on Jakey Gordon, despite the positives I think he brings to this style of game plan, partnering with Noah. What do you think about this combination, but also Tate and Ben off the bench? I think Jake's earned, earned his time to sort of start these two tests. Like, I think he was very good against Wales and Georgia. I think Nick White copped a lot of slick, um, stick, sorry, for what he what he was sort of, uh, how he was playing more like against um, South Africa and Perth. I didn't think he was as bad as people are suggesting, but I think I think the way Jake just sort of started the year, he's earned the right to just keep sort of forming this partnership then. I agree with you with Noah. Like a lot of time we've been, this is what we've been calling for. Like even in losses, let's just give these young tens some time, let them figure it out. Let them just, instead of just chopping and changing the entire time. And, you know, there, there was a, Stark difference from game one to game two, even with a forward pack that wasn't really delivering a vastly different sort of amount of game line ascendancy or sort of front football for him to execute. So like he'll be better for it. And I think we saw it's one of those ones. I think that's the best partnership we have, even though they don't have that sort of state combination together or the past experience of White and Alessio goes. And I like I like Tate as, a, as almost like that sort of change of pace back, just so he can come on, just dart and just finish a game and you know a lot of people will call for him to start and that's fair enough but I think he's sort of impact as a sort of 25 30 minute player that can really open up a game late and alongside a more mobile half in Ben Donaldson so you can take the line on you can work the space a bit more I think that's a good combo regardless of how much time they play together it's almost while I don't have the club combinations I think the styles of the two halves 
with Gordon and Alessio starting, a bit more kick focused, a bit more sort of play the territory, and then mm. finishing with your running duo of McDermott and Donaldson fits a style better than what sort of maybe past experience would suggest. Mm, look, it's it's still yeah, like I do think for this particular match it does work, but I mean Dury is still a little bit out for me on 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 the halves combinations, and it's not necessarily that any of these players are bad. It's just who combines with who the best for the scenario that you find in front of you. Um, and look, I think it, I think it should work for this particular test match, and hopefully we just can continue to see growth and an answer to those questions around those leadership and halves positions. And again, you know, with Noah, dude's only had 21 tests. Like he's still very early into his career. And so just let the boy have time. Back three. He's like, he's like 24. Yeah, he's 24. He's, he's, he's young. So much time. He's young. And and don't con- con- consign him to the to the heat. To, if you're one of those people who are so like overly critical of him and saying he should never be ne- let near a wall of his jersey again, you do exist. You guys are out there. Just leave him alone, guys. He, he just, just give the boy time. Back three, we have uh, we have Marika, of course, um, starting in his sixtieth match, sixtieth, sixty first Test match. Uh, we have Andrew Kellaway and we have Tom Wright in the back three. I mean, Rince, pretty much. You know, I don't, I don't think, didn't see that. Think that was going to be uh, changed. Not surprised by the result. Max Jorgensen serves as the kind of the key reserve to come off there. I was. You know, I, I did see a couple of people argue that Kellaway maybe doesn't have as much power as he normally does. I think, though, I would still be starting him over some, someone like Jordan yeah. just because of his kicking game and game strategy is a lot better. He he can serve as a good option for full um, in fullback in the event something goes down. He's just a better utility option. Um, as much as Jorgensen has sheer speed, I think it makes much more sense to open Jorgensen up later in the game when players are fatiguing. Um, he's a much better option there. You saw it in that box test match where um, he came so close to, you know, he got into open space and looked very, very dangerous. But, you know, no changes here in terms of, uh, no changes here in my opinion in terms of uh, options in the, you know, in the back three. And nor do, nor do I think you need to. Like, I mean, Jorgensen yeah. turns 20 on Monday. Like, let's just, we have the, we uh, you know, the back three options that we have are great enough that we don't need to rush this kid in after one flash of sort of flashy movie in South Africa. Like, let's mm. tr- trust in Callaway, you know. Um, if It's one of those things. In wet conditions last week, again, oh, last week, last game, tough to really sort of unleash and show what he's all about, but he's a great defensive mind. I think Tom Wright, again, a couple of try-saving tackles as well he made, which I think sort of flown under the radar as people are sort of calling for change in that back three. I mean, and Marika's Marika, like he's just a freak. So yeah. it's a tough back three to crack and there's no need to mix it up right now when you have three world-class players back there. So I think this is the right move again. Yeah, um, absolutely. Complete, not, uh, completely agree. And um, I've left it deliberately till last and uh, it's, of course, the discussion of the centres. We have the big announcement. Finally, our boy Hamish Stewart will uh, get his uh, long-awaited Wallaby cap he is going to debut at inside centre, partnering Len Ikatao on the outside. Very curious to see how this goes. Um, very excited as well. I think um, Hamish, of course, is, is long time is due for this. I was thinking maybe it would be a case where it would be a, a similar to, to the halves pairings. It would be a combination thing. Maybe you bring someone like an Ikatao off the bench and then Hamish part, you partner Hamish with someone like a Josh Fluke. But then again... You know, that's not a lot of experience then between those two halves. That would be a very inexperienced side given Flukes only had, you know, two or three test matches. So I think this is probably the best combination here. Um, Thoughts, feelings, opinions on this one? I mean, aside from the obvious, like, thank bloody God, finally Hamish has his cap. He's well overdue. It's about time. Like someone who's (laughs) really toiled his way through Super Rugby, over 100 caps and finally getting it. You'd hear the cheers from Queensland when he finally got the, and he's adopted new state of Western Australia when he got his got his um, inclusion. Like he's just, he's just such a solid rock of a player. Like he's just, he's almost like a perfect twelve to have in this system. And he's so, like defensively outstanding. Like his combination with Len Nicotel, they're going to be almost like levitating across that back line, just moving everyone into space and marshalling mm. everyone perfectly. You then have another playmaking option that can just kick a bit more, you know, utilize those crossfield kicks, which Joe's sort of keen to implement into the game a bit more. And 
you know, try and benefit. I'll try and use those sort of speedy outside back. So I think this is this was the logical option. And it's sort of a long overdue selection for Stewart. And I, like a lot of people were throwing up the fluke option. Like he's never played 12 at super rugby level, like mm. Lenny Cattell. So you'd have to almost sudden just, are you going to do a makeshift 12 and push someone in a position? Or are you going to go for a guy who has 110 caps, 120 super rugby caps? Um, most of those are, are sort of 10 or 12, like someone who's used to the position, someone who's comfortable in this setup. Like it's, it's a no brainer in my opinion. Mm. I'm going to go out on a limb here and I don't, and not at the risk of jinxing the poor lad. Um, but, you know, we've often talked about throwing players in too early and we've often talked about the, the idea of, you know, strong, a strong season or two in super rugby does not necessarily make a great player. I am really, I think he's going to hit the ground running and not necessarily produce a perfect performance. I mean, you're, you're playing for your, your first ever test match in Wallaby Gold. You will be nervous. I mean, freaking Matt Burke dropped his first ever ball uh, the first time he ever started uh, for the Wallabies. And it's, it was one of the worst drops you've ever going to see in your entire life. Um, I think it won't be a perfect performance, but I think Hamish will look comfortable. In this in this situation, given it has taken him as long as it ha- as, he, as he has to, to get to that, he's a one a one again as we've mentioned a hundred plus caps at Super Rugby level. Dude actually has a lot of experience, and he's still got a lot of time ahead of him uh, in terms of his career. So he has plenty of opportunity to get a lot of caps under his belt in Wallaby Gold. So I'm I think he'll he'll do all right. Really, the, the only concern for me is just the fact that he's partnering with Ikatao and that there is, you know, that's the that's the X factor grey area there. But that other playmaker might unleash Ikatao even more because Ikatao hasn't exactly been firing this year compared to previous years. So in short, I think there's a lot to like in this squad, a lot to like, Nathan. Yeah, I agree with you. Like, it's all logical decisions. Like, the captaincy one obviously will be the big talking point out of this, but... In terms of the one of twenty three that's on the field, like it's all all makes sense. Very, I mean, very. I feel like we said this so many times with Joe, but it's rewarding people in form. You get we're getting. I think this is a better squad than was out there against South Africa with your Frost, your Tupos coming back into the lineup. Um, like, yeah, I'm just excited to see how they rip in against an Argentinian side who's got a lot to play for and you know can produce anything from a. Magical win over the All Blacks to a forty-point thumping, where they look like a second grade side. They've got a lot to you know play for this weekend as well, because Creepy, as you mentioned at the top of the pod, it's his last match, nineteen years um, playing for Los Pumas, and in that time, I think it's fair to say that Argentinian side has been completely transformed um, into one of the the real unpredictable, dangerous sides of international rugby. Um, Phenomenal career. uh, And I think it's, you know, there's going to be a lot of emotion on the line. And if there's one thing that I think Filippo Filippo Contopomi can definitely get out of this side, it is getting Argentinians playing with passion. Do we see a win? I've I've said throughout this period, I think we win at least one. I'm not sure if it's this one. I think... If I had to go on a limb, I think we win this one. I think this is the sort of game where we, if we can start, well, I've said this so many times, but if we can start strong early in science, the crowd, I think we've got enough enough depth to really sort of test them and, you know, put their pack under pressure, put that put the set piece under pressure and really almost out Argentina, Argentina. Like they have, mm. look at the team they've named, they've got strong sort of midfield and outside backs, but I think there is sort of, I think New Zealand showed the method to sort of get on top of them. It's, through the sort of set piece, through the scrum, it's not as yeah, it's sort of to reiterate, it's not as strong as it was last year or last sort of times, last versions of Argentine sides we've played. This is our best sort of type five that we have cut right now. I think you know, I'll say I'll say we get it done by six or seven. Oh wow, that's a that's a that's a tight that's a tight game. But yeah, I'm I still am not totally convinced we'll win this one. Um, I think you know the Argentinians have a, have a knack to come out firing. So I'm going to go Argentina, but. It's a thriller. I reckon it's going to going to be a thriller and more of an indication of uh, a potential win next week, um, which will be exciting. We've got to go back to work, but a lot before we go, one last quick topic of discussion that uh, I want to kind of mention, which has been the big news that has kind of been circling around Australian rugby, which is the the news around David Nusifora, um officially signing up to Scotland. Um, he's been under contract here in Australia in Australia um, and is expected to finish up in November. I believe is when yeah, is what Phil, Phil War said. Um, 
is, is what I've heard on the grapevine. I mean, he was, we already knew he was like doing contract work and everyone's kicking up a stink that, uh, I mean, that, that, you know, he's, he's here and then all of a sudden he's gone. Um, are we overreacting here? Uh, and also, also it's more to the point, what is actually, what is, what has David actually been working on here? Um, I th- to start with, I think we overreacted to his hiring in the first place. It's, mm. He was an advisor. He's sort of, Peter Horn's always been sort of the main man and what he's been working on with sort of Peter, what Peter and David have been working on is that contracting model and um, sort of moving of the players and really sort of aligning that system. Um, mm. David, David Isorosic is a gun for hire. Like he will work for whoever, whichever company or whichever sort of team needs him. So like this was always probably going to be a short-term process or as you know, given his quality, there was bound to be someone else to sort of come after him and, it's like, it looks bad because it was always like, a, oh, he'll come when the Olympics finish. And then as soon as the Olympics finish, he gets announced for Scotland. But like, don't get me wrong. He's been like, oh, don't get it wrong. He's been working behind the scenes for a while now. He's been, mm. his fingerprints are, will be on the Australian rugby for years to come for what he's done sort of this six six to nine month period he'll be in the role. But Peter Horn's the main man in charge here. He's the one who's overseeing it and would have been picking David's brain to get enough out of him. But he, he'll move on like any other contractor does and... It's just at, with Peter at, at the sort of helm, I have full trust that it's going to be heading in the right direction. And like, it's not as big as a loss, I think, as people are making out or not as big as a, I don't think people are throwing around ridiculous words like calling the traitor and stuff like that. Maybe not that far, but people <laughs> questioning what his sort of loyalty. And it's like, it's not that big of a deal. He's a contractor. He's going, just going on to the next job. It's probably, it's probably coloured with all the previous interactions that he, he'd had or dealt with or spoken about in the public arena regarding, you know, the future, you know, his previous experiences with Rugby Australia, um, you know, ages ago. But, look, yeah, I mean, he was always he was always like under a contractual obligation, like just a, he was under a contract as a, as a consultant. So it wasn't really that much of a shock to me when I heard it. Um, and so, look, I'm very curious, though, as just to see exactly what his work, the work that he has done with, with Peter Horn and all that, what, what are these player contracts going to look like? What is this centralization platform going to look like? And I know that we'll probably find out in due course, but um, obviously there's the fact that there is such a gray area around that. And then you just get this announcement that he's going elsewhere. Does it doesn't look good, but hopefully, you know, if, if, if we start to hear exactly what has come out or what is being announced, what are these pathways going to look like? What are these contracts going to look like? Then we'll go, Oh, so he was doing work behind the scenes. It's just a case of wait and see, I guess. It'd be one of those ones where you don't sort of, it won't get almost officially announced like, oh, David did this, David did this, they did that. But all of a sudden, if you say a bit more like common sense around moves and transfers, you'd be like, oh, this is, a, just think this is a system like he's been helping to create. Mm, interesting. It'll be one to keep a watch on, definitely for sure. Short and sweet. Actually, short and sweet this time. We actually lived up to all of the, the, the chat and didn't go for a, a, an hour or so. Again, Wallabies. I know, isn't it? Wallabies are, are going to play Argentina um, in La Plata on Sunday at 8 a.m. Like, how good is that time zone? Thank you, Argentina, Amazing. for, for being Thank where you, you are. Well, Make, makes my makes our lives so much easier. No more 1 a.m. starters in South Africa. Thank you very much. Um, hope you guys all get on to it. Hope you guys all enjoy that ep- um, uh, this rapid fire, this fast edition of the uh, of the dropped kickoff. Um, we're working. We've got to go back to work. So pleasure as always, everyone, and all the best. Go the Wallabies.